really loved the taste. In other words, the, the, the stimulus itself was what was driving the behavior. This was kind of the way behaviorists thought about how the mind worked. But it turned out to not be the case. And after hundreds of, of looking at hundreds and hundreds of kids, he realized that every kid wanted the marshmallow. In fact, that's why they were waiting. Some kids wanted the marshmallow so much, they were willing to resist temptation for 15 minutes in order to get a second marshmallow. So they clearly loved marshmallows too. Instead, what Walter found as, as the determinant variable in terms of whether or not kids could wait, is whether or not they were able to distract themselves. Really metacognition, it's, it's what that, that skill really is. So some kids, even at the age of four, realize that if they were looking at the marshmallow, if they were focused on the reward itself, the thing they were trying to resist, they wouldn't last very long. They, they knew how weak willpower was. So that if they were looking at it, they were going to pop it in their mouth. So these were kids who would go stand in the corner, or sing songs from Sesame Street, or pretend to fall asleep, or pretend the marshmallow was a big, puffy cloud they could play with. They were the kids who temporarily forgot about the stimulus. They found a way to turn the hot stimulus and cool it off a bit. Interestingly, this is a skill that only turns on at about the age of four. So you take a three and a half year old and say, here, resist this marshmallow. Every three and a half year old acts the same way. What they do is they lock into the reward. They stare straight at it. They want to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And, and there's a certain logic to that too, but, but, but because of the weakness of willpower, because of the fact that willpower and self-control are such feeble mental muscles, before long that marshmallow is going to be in your mouth. So these are kids who, even at the age of four, you saw this variation in terms of how good they were at metacognition, how good they were at thinking about thinking and knowing that if they were looking at the marshmallow, they were going to eat it. So what they had to do was find a way to distract themselves. So, so you know, Walter published a few papers in the late 70s and, and you know, talked about metacognition, talked about delayed gratification, and he assumed he was done with marshmallows. How much can you say about delayed gratification in four-year-olds? Then he was talking to his daughters, all of whom also went to the Bing Nursery School. This is 12 years later. They're now in high school. And, uh, and he's talking to them, and he says, oh, how is you know, Jane doing? He said, oh, Jane's doing great. She's a straight-A student. She's going to go to Harvard or Stanford. She's, she's such, such, such a smart girl. And Walter thinks, oh, that's, that's interesting, because uh, Jane could wait full, the full 15 minutes. And he says, well, how is you know, Jack doing? He said, oh, Jack's in trouble. Jack's really not a good student at all. And Walter think, oh, that's interesting, because Jack couldn't even wait 30 seconds. And, and so, so he asked enough of these questions to begin to imagine there being some correlation between how the kids behaved at the age of four and how they were doing in school. So he sent out this exhaustive questionnaire to every kid in the marshmallow task, got back a few hundred answers, analyzed the data, and sure enough, what he found is that the most predictive test you can give a four-year-old is the marshmallow test. <laughs> that, that it's much more predictive than the IQ test, much more predictive than a verbal skills test that it's very good at predicting things like GPA, how many friends you have, how your teachers see you, whether or not you try drugs, um, you know, whether or not you lose your temper. The, 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 the most impressive factoid is that the, the difference between a kid who can wait 30 seconds and a kid who can wait 15 minutes is that the kid who can wait 15 minutes has an SAT score 210 points higher than the kid who can't wait. So this is 12 years later, and it's very, very predictive. Now, now the, the, you know, the initial, I think, thing to take away from the study um, is that, you know, it's kind of bleak. It, it, it made me sad when I first heard about this data and was talking to Walter about it because, you know, it kind of leads you to believe that we should just give every four-year-old the marshmallow task. And if he can't wait 15 minutes or even two minutes, then, you know, are we really going to waste 12 years of school on you? <laughs> that it, just, it, it, just seems, it just seems kind of unnecessary. That, that, sound, that sounded even harsher than I wanted it to sound. I apologize. <laughs> but, but that turns out to be the exact wrong conclusion. That Walter's also done studies with kids in the South Bronx. So these are kids who, in general, it's a very poor community outside New York, um, in, in general have a tougher time waiting than kids who grew up in Palo Alto, which isn't, which isn't too surprising at all. But he found if you gave these kids a very short lesson, a crash course in metacognition, he taught them a few simple rules about how to think about a temptation like a marshmallow or in a cookie. All of a sudden, you can take kids who couldn't wait 30 seconds, and now they can wait 25 minutes. Sometimes, all the lessons were, were, why don't you draw a picture frame around the marshmallow? So that all of a sudden, it's not a real marshmallow, it's just a picture of a marshmallow. Sometimes, the lessons were simply showing kids videotapes of other children successfully resisting the marshmallow and cookies. So very simple lessons in how to think about thinking that led to this profound, profound improvement in terms of how kids could actually perform in the marshmallow task. He's now gotten funding to 
take the study to, to try to do a larger longitudinal study of this in various KIPP schools in Philadelphia and New York, where we're taking a much larger sample of kids, giving them lessons in metacognition, how to think about temptations, and how to think about you know, their homework and all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and trying to see if, if this actually generalizes, if these simple courses you give kids on how to think about thinking stop just being about marshmallows and temptations, but actually become about schoolwork. Because, you know, it really is the same suite of cognitive tools, cognitive strategies. Uh, you know, the, the same strategies you use to resist a marshmallow when you're four are also the same strategies you use when you're 15 and you'd love to watch your favorite television show when you've got algebra homework. It, it's all about, I've got this long-term goal here, and you know, it's going to involve some short-term suffering. How can I arrange my thoughts? How can I control what I'm thinking about, control the spotlight of attention, so that I can actually accomplish what I want to accomplish? And that cashes out as metacognition, as whether or not you're able to think about thinking in the right way. The, 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 last, I think, thing, medic, the last thing that metacognition gives you, I think, is it allows you to use the right mental tools at the right time. One of my favorite metaphors for the mind is that it's a bit like a Swiss Army knife, that it's stuffed full of all these different strategies and tools, each of which is very well suited to a particular situation, be it interpreting radar blips, or making a moral decision, or resisting a tempting treat that you probably shouldn't indulge in. And, and, and so the real lesson, I think, of decision making, of, of all this fancy brain scans and, and single electrode recordings and dopamine neurons and primate brains, what it really cashes out as is how we think should depend on what we're thinking about. That, that the real challenge of decision making is taking all this knowledge and making sure we're applying it to specific contexts in the right way. So making a decision about cereals will probably involve a, a very different set of mental muscles, a very different set of cognitive strategies than thinking about the stock market. Um, but, but how we think should really depend on what we're thinking about. Uh, and that will ensure that we're using the right tools in the right way at the right time. So I've, I've talked for far too long, I'm afraid. I, I would love to take some questions and, and offer whatever answers I can. But thank you all so much for coming. It really is a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. In the Red Sox shirt. I mean, you know, it's a great question. Um, I think the, the, the question was classroom learning, um, you know, one of the goals of classroom learning is to make sure kids don't have to make every possible mistake there is to make, that you want to fast forward the learning a bit. And please correct me if I'm getting your question wrong. Um, that you show, you know, you show a kid, don't solve the calculus problem this way, because that's the wrong way. Do it this way, which is the right way. So you're trying to educate them by using mistakes, just not mistakes they've made on their own. Um, I think you know, it, it, it really depends on the domain. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, first of all, it's also important to note that I think a lot of this research remains sketchy, and so it's, it's tough to give a definitive answer. But I think at this point in time, I think the utility of teaching people other mistakes abstractly, you know, showing them on a blackboard, don't do this, but not actually forcing them to make it themselves, depends on whether or not they're, 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 they're forced to go through that consciously. So you know, if you're solving a calculus problem, Chances are you're probably going to have to solve that consciously anyways. Your unconscious, as smart as it is, isn't going to solve calculus for you. Um, so, so in that case, teaching people you know, mistakes in the blackboard may actually be effective. Um, other studies have looked at pilots and pilot error, for instance, and found that blackboard learning is actually not so effective. That teaching a pilot, you know, don't do this when you're approaching Heathrow in the snow, that's not effective at all, and that's because pilots are actually much more reliant on their unconscious to make these snap decisions. That's why pilots have become so reliant on cockpit simulators, um, because they need to make those mistakes in person. They need to crash the plane. They need to do all the wrong things in, this, you know, in the simulator, in these fancy, fancy simulators, so that when, you know, when the money's on the line, when actually flying a real plane, not a software program, they don't make those same mistakes. So, so I think it, it depends on the domain whether or not, you know, in, in just how reliant you are on your unconscious to make those decisions. Um, so, so sometimes teaching people about, you know, Teaching people abstractly about mistakes can be very effective, 
and, and sometimes if you're forced to make snap decisions, if you're forced to really rely on your unconscious, it's not going to be so effective at all. Yeah. What type of uh, criminal or politician did the kid who hollered out the Oreo become? <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked one of Walter's collaborators what happened to him, and, and, and this, was, uh, this, was, this was about a year ago. Uh, and he, he, he made the joke he's probably working at AIG. Um, <laughs> That was just a joke I should emphasize. Um, uh, you know, I, I often wonder, um, because those kids, of course, were thrown out of the study. Um, if you couldn't follow the rules, um, you weren't included in the follow-up sample. Um, but, but, you know, a fair number of kids, especially boys, were the ones who found a way around the rules. Yeah, which, which I was like, like, those are some clever four-year-olds, too. Um, so, you know, but nobody knows what happened to them. So, uh, you know, he, he could be ruler of the universe one day, for all we know. Um, I, I should also note that they're actually still following these people. So they're now in their 40s, and they're now actually doing a brain scanning study as we speak here at Stanford, um, trying to find what the brain differences are between these, the now 40, 41, 42, 43, uh, and, and come up with some very interesting results. But they're not tracking the rule breakers? No, they're not tracking the rule breakers. Yes. Uh, what, what does it say about people who do things like bungee jump or go to horror movies? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, the, I mean, this question is really about behavioral genetics as far as I'm concerned, um, which, which there, are lot, there have been lots of articles and, and peer-reviewed papers on how difficult it's been to actually find genes in the brain that seem to predict behavior. You know, the Human Genome Project was solved 10 years ago, and, and there are all these optimistic projections that by now we'd have the genes for schizophrenia, for bungee jumping, for slot machine gambling, for being nice. For, you know, we, go, we, could, we could go down the Myers Briggs and basically say, this gene leads to this, this gene leads to this disposition, and so on. That's not been the case at all. Um, that there have been very few genes that we've actually found that correlate with behavior. And that's in large part because there are so many genes and the brain is just so damn complicated. But in terms of bungee jumping and risk-seeking behavior, as it's known, there, there actually have been some very interesting studies that have actually connected to the dopamine system. So there are all sorts of dopamine receptor subtypes, DRD1A and stuff like that. And, and certain alleles, certain types of genes actually do seem to correlate, not, you know, not, not in a very profound and dramatic way, but, but in a subtle but statistically reliable fashion with bungee jumping, with gambling, with, with enjoying these kinds of risk-seeking behaviors. Uh, and, and there are some hypotheses about why that is, about you know, some people just need to do more dramatic things to get those dopamine juices flowing, um, to make a long story short. But that actually is one of the few, I think, success stories of behavioral genetics in terms of connecting genes to behavior. Uh, and, you know, not to oversell it, but I think it is interesting that it does come back to dopamine and genetics and, 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 and these neurons, which is just a very small part of the brain. About 1% of all neurons in the brain are dopamine neurons, and yet they seem to play a very, very important role in terms of controlling things like attention, pleasure, and the ability to perceive patterns. I'm, in, I'm interested in the four-year-olds. I haven't gotten past yeah. that, being only five and a half myself. But, uh, you, I think you indicated that the kids who passed the four-year-old mar marshmallow test mm -hmm. did very well 12 years later. Yeah. Now, move on to the Bronx. I think you then said you could teach kids yeah. in the Bronx to pass the four-year-old test. Yeah. How did they do at the age of those that you taught? In other words, does that work for anything else or just for marshmallows? It's a great question. Those, the Bronx sample was not followed up. So, so, but, but, but the good news is that, is that he's, he's now, in, in collaboration with people like Angela Duckworth at Penn, doing a longitudinal study where he's going into these schools, low-income schools, teaching kids these metacognitive skills, and now he's following up, trying to see if these skills generalize. So we should have an answer in, you know, 12 years or so, uh, it, sh it shouldn't take that long. Um, there, you know, but, but, but it's not, it's not going to be an immediate answer. I, th I think they're optimistic. I, th I think they're especially optimistic at a younger age. Um, so, so the interventions, and this is, this is one of the sad parts of the story, I, I, 